The next uh, conversation will be with um, Banu Ogan, a dancer from the Merce Cunningham troupe, and Emma McClendon, a curator here at the museum. They'll be talking about the collaboration between Merce Cunningham and Ray Kawakubo of Come des Garçons, who did the costumes for Cunningham's scenario. Well, firstly, I would like to thank Valerie for that wonderful introduction and for having us here today. But I would also really like to thank Banu Ogun for being here with us today. She was a member of the original cast for Scenario, and she actually recently um, oversaw the restaging of a performance of Scenario by a ballet company in Dusseldorf, Germany, earlier this year. Uh, she's here with us all the way from Santa Fe, New Mexico, where she currently teaches at the Santa Fe University of Art and Design. But past posts have included teaching at Juilliard, the Merce Cunningham Dance Studio, and also Marymount Manhattan College. Um, for those of you not familiar with Scenario, it was first performed by the Merce Cunningham Company in 1997 at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. The choreography was by Merce Cunningham himself, and it really kind of included all of the hallmarks of his unique technique. So intense athletic speed, balletic precision, the curvaceous, almost convulsive flexibility more often associated with modern dance, um, and also an incorporation of the chance operations as a device to actually combine the elements of the choreography itself. But as you can probably tell from the image here, the costumes were anything but typical. For Scenario, Cunningham made the bold decision to invite Rei Kawakubo, avant-garde Japanese fashion designer and founder of the label Comme des Garçons, to design the costumes and be the artistic director for the piece. The costumes that she created drew on her then recent Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body collection, now very fondly and often referred to as her bump collection, um, quite appropriately, as you can see from the photo here. And the collaboration has really become probably one of the most renowned and somewhat notorious collaborations between a fashion designer and choreographer in recent history. I'm sure many people in the audience are wondering, Banu, what it was like to actually dance in one of these costumes by Kawakubo. Um, this was one of the first times that, in my experience, where we actually had to rehearse in the costumes before the premiere of the dance. And those bumps were down, so they were really hot. <laughs> and uh, we all had, I had four costume changes, but, and, and Jeannie, the the woman who wore the armless costume also had four costume changes, but for the most part, we wore the blue and green gingham, and then a red, a black set, and then a red set. So we were changing frequently in the wings, which was unusual, unusual for a Cunningham piece. And certain aspects of the choreography were very challenging, particularly partnering. Um, that section with the dancer Jeannie Steele with no arms, falling onto the stage, I actually called her to ask her how they accomplished that because there are four men who catch her and they all have bumps on their fronts. <laughs> so she described having to sort of lean back so that she wouldn't fall forward <laughs> out of their arms. So it was um, particularly challenging to, to curve in them. We were prohibited from wearing makeup <laughs> because uh, they didn't want to ruin the costumes. Because uh, after I think the first show, we all got lipstick on the front of them <laughs> or base, and they and they took great care before the premiere to line up exactly all of our stripes and squares, <laughs> and we were trying to rehearse our steps, <laughs> and they were running around trying to fix <laughs> fix the fashion. And I imagine that with all of these down pads around the body that they were quite hot to perform in as well. Yeah, they were very hot. But I appreciated that. It's always a challenge to maintain the, your body heat. So, yeah, as a dancer, so we felt very warm dancing in those costumes. 
In any of the particular costumes that you actually had, did you feel your movements at all inhibited by the actual structure of the costume? Well, not particularly. The skirts rode up. Um, so we just had to decide that we were going to dance in <laughs> with our legs showing. <laughs> but um, they, they were very stretchy, so... As you can see, her skirt is almost all the way up, the woman on the right. Um, but they, yeah, they, we had to sort of modify the degree to which we could curve if we had a huge bump in the front of us. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I understand also that as the artistic director for the piece, Kawakubo was not only asked to design the actual costume. She was actually involved in designing the set mm -hmm. and the lighting as well. I spoke to a number of dancers doing the research and everyone sort of mentioned certain odd aspects of the set, so to speak. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the set that Kawakubo designed. Well, I learned when I was uh, staging this with my colleague Daniel Squire in, in Dusseldorf with the Ballet M. Rhein, that uh, Rei Kawakubo wanted the space to have um, no entrances and exits. So she wanted it to just be a completely white box. And Mer said, well, that's absolutely not possible. <laughs> the dancers have to leave the space and, and come back onto, this, onto the stage. And so she compromised with two, we had a wing in the, um, we had two on each side, upstage and downstage. Um, and fluorescent lights on an angle I liked the lighting. It was one of the least challenging um, light plots that I had danced in because it was it was just br bright and lit the whole time. So there was there were never any side light challenges. Absolutely, I read several correspondences between the Cunningham Studio and the offices of Comme des Garçons when I was researching this piece, and there was a very clear insistence from Comme des Garçons on preserving this idea of the white box. And it seemed almost kind of unapologetically so, trying to adhere to this vision of a box with kind of cutting off the wings and creating these very low light levels, right? Yes, and I think you mentioned that this idea mimicked her, uh, the the, the designer of her fashion boutiques. Mm. And soon after Scenario, she opened a, a store in Chelsea and we visited it and it looked very similar to, <laughs> to this <laughs> set. So here's another look just to give you an idea of how very closely the shapes on the runway mimicked those seen on the dance stage. And I was wondering, you started to touch on this a little bit at the beginning, just thinking about how the preparation for this piece really differed from past performances with Merce Cunningham. Well, typically with Merce, we would wear the costumes and hear the music on the opening night of the, of the piece, so the premiere of the piece. And in this case, we, Merce finished the piece, I'm sure, I, I'm sure he was f close to finished in any case. But we did practice in them. They fit us, they took photographs of each dancer, they decided who was gonna wear what style, and, um, and then we, we practiced in them, in this studio, and then I think also on stage because we had to sort of, it was a kind of production backstage too, because <laughs> they were so big. So we each had laundry baskets on the side with our individual costumes, but it took up a lot of room and we actually had to rehearse that. We had to rehearse the costume changes to make sure we could get into ours in time. So when Kawakubo actually visited the studio and fit some of the models and uh, the dancers, and you can see that here, what was the reaction when she sort of rolled in these prototypes? Because you hadn't seen them before, is that correct? No. This was sort of the first kind of unveiling of it, so to speak. We loved it. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were so excited to have an experience of wearing something other than a sort of neutral unitard. Fantastic. And when you actually sort of tried them on, was there a process by which you decided which dancer was going to have which costume in the performance? They decided very specifically. They took photographs of us and they assigned the styles of the costumes to us very specifically. That, that was nothing to do with us. 
And was it more than one instance that she was there with you guys? That I don't remember. I know that they came and they took photographs and they left and then they returned with the models and I think that's when we tried them on. And were you aware of Ray Kawakubo's designs before? Did you guys know that the yes. bump collection had happened? Was that kind of on your minds when you heard she was gonna design for Scenario? I think, yes, I think we didn't know maybe previous to that, but then we investigated. We weren't, I don't know if we knew that this was what she was gonna unveil. <laughs> I don't remember. Because this was quite rare, as you mentioned, you typically would have this very Cunningham process that's very unique to Merce Cunningham. If you're not familiar with his work, one signature element of his process is that actually quite in a different aspect to all of the types of dance we've seen presented so far is that Cunningham thoroughly believed that the score, so the music that would play during the performance, the choreography, what he was doing, and the costumes and set were all meant to be designed in isolation of each other and should really only kind of get introduced on opening night. And that obviously was not the case with this particular mm -hmm. performance, but did he still sort of seem to adhere to this process somewhat, though you saw it on a couple of occasions before? As much as possible. We didn't practice extensively in the costumes, maybe one dress rehearsal and that day in the studio. And with this, what were the reactions to the costumes when you first performed? So me and my partner Fufua were the first people on stage and at BAM, the audience just laughed. <laughs> We ran out and we just heard laughter and then we performed it also at the Paris Opera and same, same reaction. <laughs> so, and so we, and then it sort of set the tone for the piece mm -hmm. and we found it a very a joyful piece, I think because of the audience's reaction or that contributed to it for sure. Were there any critics who had a particular opinion of the piece after it came out? I don't remember, I'd, actually I don't remember. And did other members of the company sort of feel similar to the excitement and to actually performing it? What was the sort of feeling generally among the dancers? Well, as is typical with Merce, the choreography was very physically challenging and demanding. So the costumes added another element of that. So I think that was difficult for us to want to execute Merce's vision to the, the best of our capabilities while also wearing these cumbersome costumes. And was, did Merce seem to have an opinion sort of of the costumes at all? He never really talked about, we didn't know about those things until maybe after the fact. Um, but I think he appreciated her vision for what it was. I'm not sure if, yes, I think he appreciated her vision. And so now kind of turning to your experience in Dusseldorf with the Ballet Amran. What was it like to, first off, teach the choreography? You mentioned that Cunningham choreography is quite physically taxing. Mm -hmm. What was your experience with teaching that to a ballet company? Mm -hmm. Those dancers had a previous experience. Many of the dancers we used for Scenario had a previous experience with um, a Cunningham piece called Pondway that was staged by uh, another former ex Cunningham dancer, Andrea Weber, the year before. So they had, most of them had some familiarity with the complexity of Merce's later works. So that was very helpful, as did the rehearsal assistant. So she, I think very deliberately, um, cast the piece with the most intelligent dancers. <laughs> so that was a, a, a good sort of head start for us. Um, the piece is very challenging to learn and to execute. For instance, there's one section where there are four men and th they each have 100 positions, including and counts. So I would say on average 150 positions. And so just for us to notate one person's part took you know, six hours. And then for them to learn, for us to transmit and then for them to learn and memorize and rehearse. It's a very different way of working than I think they were used to. But um, they rose to the challenge and performed this piece very beautifully, I thought. Was there any particular preparation that you did to verse yourself with the choreography before you went out to Dusseldorf? Well, there's always a period of 
relearning, even if I, ha I had to relearn, for instance, the solo that I did, because it was um, taught to me very step by step. And in that sense, there aren't really phrases you can learn, because the arms and the torso and the legs are so separate from one another. And so, so there's a period of really sort of, um, sometimes it feels like data entry because you really just, you have to go back and you're, you're really looking frame by frame at the video to, um, to notate exactly what's going on at every moment. So that's a lot of preparation. <laughs> and w what was the experience like as a sort of juxtaposition with you learning the choreography with Merce Cunningham in the studio the first time around? So, um, for instance, that solo that I had to relearn of my own, um, it was a series of sevens and nines, counts of seven and counts of nine. And, um, and he told uh, Robert, who was then his assistant, that he was working on a very complex solo and that it was gonna take a lot of time. <laughs> so he, I think he even knew that he was onto something that was very intellectually and physically challenging for, for his dancers. Um, it was a wonderful experience always being in the room with Merce. <laughs> because at that point was, because at that point Merce was, you know, quite old, was he still teaching the choreography to you guys himself? Yes, he was still performing at that point. Um, so he, at that, in 97, he could still show some things physically. Um, and he had also very clear notes and we learned his language. <laughs> and so for the Dusseldorf performance, you didn't dance in the original, you didn't have them dance in the original costumes. No, the costumes had to be recreated. And from what I understand, the woman who was responsible for recreating the costumes, Catherine Vaufray, she is a Swiss woman who was working in Germany with the Ballet and Marine. She was, she tried to reach out to Ray Kokubo and her team and was, um, I think, from what I understand, told that she was kind of on her own <laughs> and she had to do her best. So um, she, the costumes are now being housed at, housed at the Walker Art Center. So she traveled to the Walker Art Center to observe the costumes. <laughs> Actually, she really wasn't allowed to touch them without gloves on. And, um, and took notes but she wasn't allowed to take them physically away from the museum, which is, I think, now that the costumes are museum pieces, this is an unusual thing. Usually when, when works were recreated, they would send the costumes so that the costume designer could actually reproduce them. And in this case, she really, all she had were her own notes and extensive photographs and interviews with us. <laughs> Were there any challenges when you first started to rehearse and work with these recreated costumes? What's so interesting about Merce is that when, when we recreated, when we created a new piece with him, it, it always seemed somehow impossible. And then because there's then a template that a group of dancers have accomplished the piece and have performed the piece, then it becomes possible for another generation. So they knew that we had done this, so I think they were, um, they were, they were very open to, to working with them. The costumes themselves, were there any aspects that were difficult for her to recreate? I know that when we have spoken, you mentioned the color and how the things were dyed actually was quite unique. Right, she, the fabrics were printed on, were double-sided apparently, the original costumes. And when they recreated them, they had the fabric printed as well, but only on one side. So I think she had several challenges. Um, one was interpreting the length. I think they were actually unisex. So um, on certain people, skirts look longer than others, but she was very meticulous about trying to get them at the right length. And, and then those skirts, like I said, they rolled up. And because they were, the fabric was printed only on one side, you could really see that. So I think we had three dress rehearsals and after every dress rehearsal, she took extensive notes and then at, in the end decided to double um, sew another side of fabric on the underneath so that when the fabric flipped, it wasn't obvious. 
And in Dusseldorf, did you recreate the set? I mean, it seems quite here that you were very much looking at that white space again, but did you try to recreate all aspects? So the person who um, was responsible for lighting the piece, David Covey, the original piece, he uh, is a professor at Ohio State University, so he was asked to come to to light the piece there, make notes that could be put into the Cunningham dance capsules for future recreations of the dance, and um, and then yes, they did uh, make a truss with the fluorescent lights that pretty much duplicated the original version. And I guess sort of by way to kind of conclude is, has your view on scenario in this particular piece in the costume, has it changed over time as you've taken on these different roles? It's always so interesting to get in really involved in Merce's work on the other side of things and actually learn all of the parts in the, in the piece. Um, in, in this case in particular, I think this is one of the most complex pieces that I've restaged of Merce's and it was just mind-blowing, <laughs> the level of complexity in this piece. Um, there's, a, there's a section in the end called the tango that's about six minutes long and I think my notes are half of an, a notebook just for a six minute section and in fact, all of the phrases are the same, but with slight, slight, ever so slight variations, and even within couples, ever so slight variations. So it it was just, um, it's always such a treat to understand how how Merce worked in in his mind and to sort of uncover the layers of complexity there. I mean, he's just a brilliant man. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, um, sort of saved by the bell, I guess. Um, Unfortunately, we were not able to show the full extent of the video, but due to that, I guess we probably have a lot more time for questions because we weren't allowed to show, able to show the video. Um, so does anyone have any questions that we could open it up? I have a question. <laughs> both, uh, both Merce Cunningham and Ray Kawakubo are or were tremendous iconoclasts in their field. And I wonder if the two of you could talk a little bit about in what way, how did they differ from their contemporaries and predecessors? What made their work so revolutionary? Because the, the joining of two such iconoclastic artists is an extraordinary event. Absolutely, I mean, I think that from the pieces shown, both the costumes by Rei Kawakubo and the runway pieces as well. You can really see that this collection is a very extreme example of how she was really challenging traditional notions of feminine beauty and what the beautiful body really looks like. And she really addressed that in her clothing on a lot of levels, both in terms of the fit, often her clothes would be quite loose fitting and deconstructed in certain elements and it wouldn't fit the way you typically would find. But then in this particular case, she's really distorted the body. And I, I'm sure you have some views on Merce Cunningham and his, uh, his approach. Yeah, I would just say just quickly to answer that, because, yeah, the, that just by nature that he would allow his very clear sort of physical forms to be quote unquote distorted <laughs> and um, shows the openness he, that he had to new ideas and to working with people whose, um, whose vision might, might have collided with his in a sort of unexpected way. Absolutely, and I think also to kind of tail end that too with Merce Cunningham, you really do have a complete sort of divorcing of narrative and dance. Um, we've been talking a lot about the narr narration in these ballet performances, but with Merce Cunningham, it was really about the movement in space and about him combining a lot of different types of motion and then really sort of showing them in this very unconventional way and also combining them through the use of chance operations as well, which is very important. I'm viewing this uh, image here and was wondering how the uh, partnering had to differ or did it differ? Yeah, it just became a little bit more challenging. We, you had to take a little bit more time um, 
lifts were hard when you were coming at one another face to face and both of you had bumps. <laughs> I think uh, it was harder for the men when they were lifting us, I think, that sort of the timing and the, and the shape of things changed, for sure. It's a Turkish name. My dad is Turkish. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. I'm not sure. I mean, that's a very kind of... Oh, the question was, is there any reference to Martha Graham's lamentation in the armless costume that was shown sort of earlier that was a direct adaptation from the runway look that was in the slide. And I think the answer is probably not an overt one because it was drawn directly from Rei Kawakubo's runway show. But I think that when you put it into dance, there is a certain connection that would be drawn there. I just want to add something about that sleeveless costume. I think in my experience, and maybe maybe this happened in earlier years with Merce, but in my experience, that that costume was the first time that Merce choreographed a, a, a one-minute section explicitly for the costume. So there are four men partnering a woman around who is not using her arms at all. <laughs> and, and that was a result of the costume that she wanted to include in, in, in the piece. When Merce first began, to choreograph in the 40s and later in the early 50s. He was derided by his contemporaries who the women wore full skirts and expressed deep emotions and his um, style was to have uh, these you know, very linear kinds of uh, leotards and tights that were designed by uh, people like Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, Remy Charlotte and others. Uh, th this was a collaboration of artists, not fashion people. This to me seems like being a fashion victim, this particular <laughs> thing. But um, there was a piece that he did uh, about 1958 called Antic Meat, in which there were all these costumes that were ridiculing uh, some of the, uh, the costumes that Martha Graham had in, in her work. And it was a very funny piece. And the costumes are extraordinary, and they are illustrated uh, in, in, in books uh, about uh, his work. But um, most of his work, uh, the, the costumes were very, very simple in terms of, of uh, construct, and it made a mobility uh, very possible and very visible as opposed to this. Con this this uh, association, I think, was the most unfortunate in his long history of, <laughs> of artistic collaboration. And I know personally, having been his manager from 57 to 61, um, I was closely uh, involved with the company at that time. And um, I, I regret this experience. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> Do you have any? <laughs> well, I think, I think it is a good thing to point out that this was his first instance of collaborating with a fashion designer. Merce Cunningham was very famous, as you said, for collaborating with fine artists like Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, Andy Warhol even. And in those collaborations, it is important, other than Antic Meat, which you mentioned, the costumes are always very secondary. The sets would be incredibly elaborate. They would move around, the dancers would kind of have to dodge around them, but then the dancers would actually typically just wear unitards more often than not. And I think the unitard is really important for the Merce Cunningham aesthetic because it really showed the body to its full extent. So the fact that he allowed Rei Kawakubo to come and work, I think, was a very amazing opportunity where, as Valerie said, two iconoclasts really coming together whose medium is the body, in a sense, and then creating this, this work that very much kind of pushes and pulls with both of their ways of working, both in terms of the fact that the dancers are literally pulling apart Kawakubo's dresses, and then the dancers and the choreography is very inhibited by the costumes themselves, so. I'm curious, did the designer explain anything while she was doing those fittings with you? Did she explain what her... No. Yeah. 
<laughs> they, they were speaking in Japanese most of the time, so <laughs> we couldn't understand. Um, and uh, one thing that I, I found very interesting, you mentioned that we were pulling apart, apart her fashion design. At the end of every show, she and her, well, probably only her assistants, were meticulously pulling back the little snags back through the fabric on the other side. <laughs> After every show at BAM, before they left town, and we thought, okay, well, these are going to get really snagged <laughs> in the length of the piece. Other than uh, his uh, choreographing for the uh, woman with dancing without arms for that dress, did he make any other significant changes in the choreography once he saw you in the costumes, or was that all just up to you? To Not at all. That was up to us in the same way that if he gave us something impossible to do on stage, it was up to us to <laughs> make something out of it. Hi, thank you so much. I, I'm interested in a couple comments that you made, and I'm really interested in hearing a little bit about the music, which we didn't yeah. hear. Yeah. Um, Emma, your comment about non-narrativity um, and the, the flow of the action in the ballet, um, connected to the comment about the tango, which we'll hear a little bit more about shortly, and the kind of, that, that sparked an idea in my head about the kind of inherent narrativity of the tango itself as a dance. I wonder if you can say a little bit maybe about that particular section of, uh, of the work and the musical part. So Merce called it the tango when he was creating it. And there, it, it's a series of very intricate footwork and partner dancing, almost like social dancing. And in the... Um, when we were working on it, we thought this has nothing to do with the tango. It was so difficult to learn. It was so, and not that tango is not difficult to learn, but this was really, I mean, so challenging for us to remember the steps and the partnering sequences. Um, and then when I was staging it with um, Daniel Squire in Germany, I was remembering an incident, incident when we were on tour in Nashville, Tennessee, and we all went out line dancing, country line dancing after the one of the shows, and we learned these line dances that are very sort of, you know, intricate footwork and can be partner dancing. And we were practicing them in the hotel parking lot before leaving town. And Merce saw us, and he said, oh, it's marvelous, this dancing that, you do, that you're doing. And he watched us practicing these dances for quite a while. And, that, and when Daniel and I were relearning them in great detail, we commented that they were very similar to line dances. <laughs> and, then, and then I had this revelation, wait a second, this is around the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. I mean, he was influenced by, by, by life and by, and by what he was observing at the time when he was creating a piece called Ocean the Olympics were on and the, and the figure skating was happening. And the day after the figure skating, he created this duet that looked a, quite a lot like <laughs> figure skating. So I think he was influenced by, by the things that were around him. So if there's not any other questions, I guess we'll turn it over for the next conversation.